I don't know, there's something about a hurricane that really gets me going. What, no amens? <laughs> you haven't been watching? There, there are household names that are in our minds this week, and, and uh, just as, as we read the scripture, that there was a household name in the minds of Jesus' disciples, too. His name was John the Baptist. John was recognized in this text as being the one that Jesus was talking about that would come before and to restore things. So today we're talking uh, about thy kingdom come. We're in a series. It's, a, it's the month of September. There's nothing special about this month except that I decided we'd do something on the Lord's Prayer. Okay? So last week was our Father who art in heaven. Okay? This week is thy kingdom come. Next week, Pastor Rockney Dahl will deal with the next phrase, which is thy will be done. Okay? So you don't, if you want the continuity of the thing, you may not want to miss. Okay? And then I'll finish off with two more pieces of the, the, actually what I don't call the Lord's Prayer, I call it the Disciples' Prayer. Because remember, if you want the Lord's Prayer, please go to John 17, where Jesus prays himself for his disciples. That's the Lord praying for us. In this prayer, he is teaching the disciples how to pray to the Father. So it's, a, it's the disciples' prayer that he is wanting them to pray, and that's why I think that it's going to be really good for us to spend some time in the next few weeks looking at that, because each piece of it has some special meaning. But I wanted to ask you a question. How many of you have ever um, wished that you could have an audience with the king? When I was dating my wife who is listening to me in the kitchen and therefore cannot be embarrassed in front of me. She's made, um, she's made a lot of chili, by the way. Y'all stay and eat, okay? Because I don't want to be eating chili for the next three weeks. Okay? <laughs> the king and I, I took my wife to see Yule Brynner. How many of you remember Yule Brynner? All those with bald heads, Raise your hand and say, I knew Yul Brynner. He's my favorite. He was the first guy to make having, you know, bald head famous. And he was the king. And it was wonderful. We enjoyed that. But have you ever wanted to have an audience with the king or indeed the queen? I, I believe that some have traveled long distances to stand at the gates of Buckingham Palace in London. Uh, or, or maybe they toured the Hermitage, raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. You have to know art. You have to be interested in white Russia. If you want to know how the czars lived in Russia before the revolution in 1917, go to St. Petersburg, Russia, the former Leningrad, which has now been changed back to St. Petersburg, and go to a huge museum where you will see as much or more than you will see in the museum in London concerning the wealth of the kings and queens of England, you will see the same kind of opulence in the hermitage in St. Petersburg because you see the kings and queens of England are the relatives of the Romanovs. In fact, all the royal families of Europe are interrelated by blood. Crazy, but true. In fact, Queen Elizabeth's husband is a Greek. Philip, part of the royal family in Greece. Some travel these long distances. Uh, maybe, maybe in your life, though, you haven't had to travel because 
you have a distant relative that was royalty of some kind, maybe a, a duke or, or a, a sir or somebody. Maybe you have a, uh, somebody who's in the military. I know that uh, my brother has uh, a real affinity for people in the military. He got an opportunity through his work in IBM to go to school in Washington, D.C. for a year with people who had been rewarded in some respects for their good service in the United States military. And these are smart people. And my brother uh, was so impressed he got a personalized license plate for his car that says USA hegemony. It's a big word. It simply means uh, America is the best and you can't tell me different. And it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing. And he learned a lot of it there at that military school. So maybe you haven't wanted to meet a queen or a king, but you have been very impressed when you met the general or you met a colonel in the military. Maybe uh, you are not impressed by kings, queens, or military people. You're impressed by people who have a big degree. They, they are, you know, they've got three doctorates behind their name and they're, they're a fellow. Uh, I, I know that what this feels like to a certain extent as a child, uh, we would go and visit auntie and uncle in Ely, just outside of Cambridge in England. And auntie, bless her heart, she always made such a fabulous meal, but the difficulty was all those knives and forks, you know. So we would look down the table and we would see which fork auntie used for which course she was serving us so we would make the right move. But you see, uncle, uncle was a fellow at Cambridge. His specialty, the Crusades. Very interesting. Uh, I have both his books, Dr. Smale by name. And, uh, uh, you know, you could say, wow, you know, I got to meet Dr. Smale. Well, if you're Indiana Jones and you're really interested in the Crusades, meeting Dr. Smale would be pretty amazing, right? You might want to do that. Maybe, maybe that's not your thing. Maybe the, the, your thing is the church. And you got to meet, you know, Cardinal so-and-so, or you were able to shake the hand of the General Conference President. No takers. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I understand. But some people are wowed by this. They really are. And they, they, they will, they, they'll go all the way to General Conference session so that they can see these people who they feel are... Are, are like royalty. Or maybe that doesn't get it for you. Maybe, maybe yours is politics. I got to go to Senator so-and-so's office and, and, and he talked about this very important issue. And You know, I, I, I didn't have this one written down, but maybe for you it's a movie star. I know we're, in, you know, we're right here in L.A., right? And maybe, maybe there are some people who bring their children to to Little Patch of Earth. Raise your hand if you know what Little Patch of Earth is. Tisk, tisk, tisk. Okay, Little Patch of Earth is the daycare that shares our property. It's what's behind us here. If you didn't know that, now you know that. It's a very successful daycare and there are quite a number of, uh, shall we say, the uh, <clears throat> movie royalty that bring their kids right here to our campus five days a week. Believe me, it's quite a, a procession every time. Well, you know, when you go to visit these people, there is protocol. Another big word, I know. There's stuff you have to do to get ready. How's that? You can't just, you know, rock up there in your sandals and your, and your shorts and your t-shirt. When you go to see the President of the United States, there's protocol. And believe me, when you go to see the Queen of England, there's protocol. There's certain things that you have to do. You are told what to wear. You are told how to bow, when to bow, just how much to bow. Ladies, you're told to curtsy. 
How many of you know what a curtsy is? It's a lost art because you see we have ceased as a nation, we have ceased in Western society to be courteous. Didn't think that word had any meaning, but this is the connection. This is the connection. We need to think about what it would be like to be in the presence of royalty because we are Adventists and someday we are wanting to stand in the very presence of God Almighty. Are we interested in being courteous? Learning what it's like, knowing the protocol of what it is like to be in His presence. Could it be that Peter, James, and John got an audience, an audience with the glorified God? I think they did. He wasn't in his usual form, his usual uh, humanity, his, his, his covering as it were. I mean, this is, the, this is the mystery I want you to know. This is the mystery about Jesus because Jesus is at the same time, he is 100% God. He is also 100% humanity. But in this instance, he takes them up onto, onto a high mountain, the Bible says here in, in this text, and he says, stand with me here. And in that moment, he transcends his human body. He transfigures his human body. And it's described by the writer saying it was as if his whole clothing was on fire, bright, shining. Now, some of us drove long distances and or flew to be in places so that we could see what it looked like when the sun was blocked out in the last eclipse. The reverse of that, of course, is when, you know, you're not supposed to look at that, right? So people, people actually bought welding masks because, of course, you know, supply and demand, this is America, right? People, people went out and bought those special glasses in order to look at the eclipse. And some of those glasses were costing 30 and $40. So the very wise ones just went down to the hardware store and bought themselves a welding mask for 30 bucks. So bright was the sun when they looked at it at the eclipse, seeing that, that fire around the side seeing that flare that came out of the side. I saw that with one of the times that I looked on TV because I didn't go outside to watch it. I just watched it on TV. Maybe, maybe that was a small one compared to the large solar flare that we were supposed to have had on Wednesday of this week. They are saying that it may correspond with the 8.1 earthquake off the coast of Mexico. Solar flares, earthquakes, hurricanes. Never before have there been two Category 4 hurricanes in the Atlantic at the same time. Never before has there been such a huge hurricane as what is barreling down on my family and yours in Florida right at this very moment. So, you know, as we are here today, we are praying, all of us, for our friends, for our family, for our fellow Americans as they flee, if they are wise, as they board up their houses and move north. If you are thinking of moving to Florida, just know that because of hurricanes like Andrew, you can no longer buy hurricane insurance in Florida. Many retirees have moved back to places like North Carolina where my brother lives. They're called halfbacks because they went all the way down to retire and then they came halfway back. I think after this hurricane, we may see uh, an exodus. And this means bad things in some respects for the economy of Florida. 
It really does, not just because of the hurricane, but because of lost business in the future. So we will have lots to pray for, my friends, and we will have lots to think about as we watch what happens in the next few hours. But this, this form that Jesus takes is dazzling. It's, it's almost too bright. Uh, it is so amazing to me, uh, Peter's reaction. Peter is now having a, an audience with the God of the universe, the Almighty. And what does he say? C can we build you a church? Now, I, I have to hold myself back at this point because having lived in Israel when I was younger, I saw how the church has put a church on top of all the holy sites. Fortunately, I was able to be in Israel at a time when they had not yet put a church on top of Peter's house in Capernaum. But too late, sorry, <laughs> if you go there now, <laughs> there is a church on top of Peter's house. Now, it's cool because they made it with see-through glass on the bottom. So you go into the church, and then you walk to the middle, and now you can look over the railing down into Peter's house. Do you know how big it is? Okay, I'm going to walk around all of Peter's house right now. Okay, so now you know how big Peter's house was. And they built a church over the top of it, over the ruins there in Capernaum. How did Peter react when he had an opportunity to be in the presence of God? Can we build you a church? I mean, this is, this is amazing. Can we put a box around you, God? This is the, this is the reaction that, that Peter has when he gets an opportunity to have an audience with God Almighty. I, I, I can't imagine why he would do that. But then the next thing is that Jesus is joined by Moses and Elijah. It's never dawned on me before I started looking at this text again in relationship to thy kingdom come, that you have Moses who represents the Law. We always talk about the law of Moses. And you have Elijah, who was a prophet. So Jesus says, These are they that speak of me. And there he is. He is transfigured between two people one who represents those who will die and be resurrected, Moses, those who who will never die and will go straight to heaven, Elijah. Not that they're any better than each other. It's just how it happens in their lives. And he's standing between them, and they represent the law and the prophets. Luke tells us at the very last chapter of Luke that Jesus says, these have to be fulfilled. The law and the prophets and the Psalms have to be fulfilled. And in fact, here he stands in this moment of transfiguration in front of Peter, James, and John, the very embodiment of the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Everything that God had ever communicated specifically to his people has now come in physical form to show them the way to continue, continue the message, continue the way back to heaven, the way back to God. Jesus tells them not to tell anyone. What do you think of that? Not to tell anyone until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. That's very interesting that he would say that. Because when he had been with them after his resurrection, if you want to look at it, it's in Acts chapter 1. He's been with them now for 40 days as the resurrected Christ. Acts chapter 1 reveals that this, this experience that Peter, James, and John had with Jesus 
doesn't seem to have had any major effect on how they perceived God. I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed. They still uh, uh, show, uh, are interested after Jesus has been resurrected. They're, they're interested in one thing. Remember, remember, Peter wanted to put a church on top of, you know, uh, build build a temple on top of Jesus. Well, he's still focused on that temple. Because you get one last chance before I go up to my father to ask me a question. And what question do they ask? When will you make Israel great again? In other words, Jesus, this is the whole reason we have been following you. Because we thought that you were the one who was going to make Israel great again. Even though Jesus has been glorified right in front of them. Even though many times he has told them, my kingdom is not of this world. It's not part of the paradigm. It's not part of the, the, the putting a church on top of God. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, 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 and everybody else in this particular religious group have done with what I have told them, with the law and the prophets. All they did was they built a church and put it on top of me. So that when I was glorified, you didn't even recognize me. All you're interested in is the glory of Israel. What about the fact that the glory of Israel is really me? They were hoping that Jesus would, would boot out the Romans. They were hoping that Jesus would take them back to the days of David and Solomon. See, Jesus just really didn't fit. He really didn't fit in their box. He's not born in a palace. He's not rich. He's not royalty. He's not nobility. And most people use the bad word for it, but he was fatherless too. So isn't it amazing that at the transfiguration, you have a cloud that comes down over Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and out of that cloud comes a voice. And this voice causes the disciples to fall flat on their face. And this voice says, this is my Son. So why at the end, after Jesus is resurrected, do Peter, James, and John not get it even then? We could ask, we could just as easily ask ourselves, I believe, the same question. As we blithely go about repeating this prayer. And, and, and I know that if you come from a, a Catholic tradition, you were probably you know, taught to say the Our, our Father you know, again and again and again and again. We repeat this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, but, but do we know what we're really saying? Do, do we know what Jesus intended for us to know when he taught his disciples? His disciples. When we say, thy kingdom come, do we understand what, what these words mean? What about the fact that it's thy or yours? What about the fact that it's not mine? Peter, James, John, this is not about you. This is not about the baggage that you have. This is not about your preconceived idea about who God is and who he has asked you to be. No, no, no. This is completely God. It's yours, God. Your ideas, your, 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 whatever you want in this situation. Do we really? This is a question I have to, have to ask myself and I'm, I'm asking you today. Do we really want to see Jesus? Say amen. amen. 
All right, now you've just condemned yourselves. Because Peter, James, and John saw God and then wanted to put a church on top of him. Wanted to put him in a box. We're not listening to what he said, church. My kingdom is not of this world. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I'm going to have to die, and then I'm going to be resurrected. Did they want to hear that? Did they want to see Jesus in any other context than a Roman beater? No. Do we, do we suffer from the same condition today? I wonder. Do we look, do we look for Jesus' footsteps? Are, are we actually looking for where Jesus is active in our world today? Are we looking for evidence his, his, let's be very, very direct. Are we looking for evidence that Jesus is at work in Santa Clarita? Not looking at ourselves and saying, oh, we're so bad. We haven't been doing anything for... No, that's not what I'm saying. Have we spent time in recent history in this congregation praying, God, show me what you are doing in Santa Clarita? Possible that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. Remember what Jesus said when he was 12 to his mom? Kind of sounds cheeky. Hey, mom, don't you want me to be about my father's business? And he wasn't talking about the carpenter's shop. She knew that because she knew who his father was. She knew that it was the heavenly father and the heavenly business that Jesus was talking about. And I keep saying to myself, I don't know that scripture shows us ever that Jesus is going to stop his work. Till, of course, he comes back and gets us and brings us to the father. So my question today is, is Jesus still about his father's business? Is he still at work? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. The Holy Spirit is still working on the lives and hearts of your neighbors and my friends here in Santa Clarita. Question is, are we watching? Is our focus on him and what he is already doing? Are we looking for his his footprints, his fingerprints. Are we looking for, for evidence that he has been around or are we spending maybe a little too much time asking him to just come be with us because we're not thinking about him at all. So when you say your, understand that that's a focal question. That's an, that's an attitudinal question. Your attitude is one that looks at him. How about kingdom? When Jesus rose from the grave, he rose a victorious king of the universe, including earth. When Adam and Eve gave away the earth to the lordship of Satan, Jesus won it back, and he won it back fair and square. He won it back legally. He, he got through all the myriad of traps that the devil set for him, and he even decided, I believe this is what caused drops of blood to come out of his head when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He refused to leave you and me behind. Because I think that was the last and final and most desperate appeal that the devil gave to Jesus, just go. You don't have to do this. Look at your disciples. They're sleeping. They don't get it. They don't care what you've done for them. Just go. Leave them to me. And Jesus said, no, not my will but thy will be done. He didn't leave us behind. If you want evidence 
of this theory of mine? Listen to the voices around the cross. Oh, he saved others. Why doesn't he just come down off of that cross? We'll believe in him then. Don't you hear the devil's voice? Just leave them behind, Jesus. Forget them. Come down off that cross. You'll look real good. But you won't fulfill your mission. He died on his own terms. I'm thoroughly convinced at this point the Jews did not kill Jesus. The Romans did not kill Jesus. Jesus said himself, I will lay down my life and I will take it up. It's by his power, his strength, his plan that he does this. Make no mistake, it was all him. So if you want to talk about Jesus and his kingdom, understand that he is already the king of this world. That is why the devil knows that his time is short. He has known that, my friends, since Jesus resurrected from the grave. That's how long he's known that his time is short. So a couple thousand years, puh, in the face of eternity, puh, just a drop. He knows his time is short and that he is done for. I just call him the spoiler. Every Every person he can get to follow him is his ability to poke God in the eye. Huh. You tried to save this one. Uh, you didn't get him. I got him. I know I'm going down, but they're going down with me. That's all he's doing. That's all the devil is doing now. That's all he can do because his end is sure. It was made sure the moment Jesus resurrected from the grave. This is my father's world, my friends. My father's world, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's his kingdom. Believe that, because if you believe that, and if you say, amen to that, brother, then you know what my next question is going to be. Are you living like you know that this is his kingdom. Or do you just know it and then you just go about doing your own stuff? See what I mean? It's real easy to say, thy kingdom come and walk out that door and just continue ruling your own kingdom. The word come, I, I believe this is a, an attitudinal statement. Thy kingdom is his kingdom. We, we, we know him. We know this is his world. We know that since Jesus rose from the grave that he has, he has been the one. But this is now a, a statement that says, would you please make this a reality in my life? Would you please make this a reality in the entire world? So when you say thy kingdom, you're saying it's his and it's his domain. But also, what about thy kingdom? Come, you are now asking God to make that a reality in your world. A reality right now. I like to tell people uh, that Seventh-day Adventists preach that when you accept Jesus, as your personal savior from sin, what begins? Tell me, tell me, saints, what begins when you accept Jesus and that legal transaction takes place and your name is written in the book of life? What begins? It, I didn't hear you. Come on now. Eternal life. Okay, so some of you have accepted Jesus a long, long time ago. That means you've been living your eternal life for a long time now. So how's it going? How's your eternal life going? 
I thank Star Wars for the next uh, analogy, and that is that I believe we are living episode one. We're living episode one of our eternal life. Why is it that we only talk about this at funerals? Oh, we're not afraid to die. Because Jesus has made it through the grave. We have eternal life. And we tell people that when people are dead. I want to start telling people that when they're alive. Because it's the best news ever. It means that death no longer has any sway over my decision making. I am not afraid of death because, you see, that's what the devil has been using all these years to get people to do what he wants them to do. Oh, if you do that, you're going to die. So now we can say back to him, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway because Jesus wants me to do it. I'm part of his kingdom. So if you're part of his kingdom, we need to start acting like we are part of his kingdom now because brothers and sisters, this is a Sabbath in your eternal life. It may be interrupted by death, but because Jesus rose from the grave, he promised that we will rise from the grave and we will continue our eternal life. Episode two, right? And you know, episode infinity. That's what's coming. So we no longer we no longer have to be afraid. Finish the sentence for me. Perfect love casts out all fear. Now you know why he said that. If you're part of his kingdom, you are operating on a system of love. And if you're operating on a system of love, you cannot be afraid. You should not be afraid. Fear should have no part of your life, your decision making. And believe me, all the advertising that's out there is predicated not on love, although there's some of that. <laughs> Fortunately, there are some great ads that show people loving other people, and it's cool, and other people want to love other people because they see the ad. But most times, the ad says, you need to do this because if you don't, you're going to die. Or your teeth are going to fall out. Or you're going to get cancer. Or what a, you know, everything is fear-driven. How about, how about we leave this place today with a hurricane coming down on Florida, with the devastation in Texas, with an earthquake in Mexico, with a bomb going off in Korea. How about we leave this place today saying, I am a part of the kingdom of God. I will fear no evil. Amen. How about it? I mean, because that's David in the 23rd Psalm saying, because you are my shepherd, because I am one of the sheep of your pastor, because I am one of the people in your kingdom, I want an audience with the king. Someday, I want to see the king face to face. But for now, I'm believing him that he has sent his Holy Spirit to help me live the life that he wants me to live. He has sent his holy angels. I was talking to friends outside this morning and saying, let's remember, <laughs> God created the angels, right? So that means he can create more, right? If he needs more, he can create more. Question, can the devil create? No. I think he's dealing with a serious lack of staff. He's having to concentrate them over there in Florida right now. Or whatever he's doing. But he can't keep up with the human population, folks. We are going to win. And Jesus is going to give us whatever we need in order to do what he asks. So we can leave here, my friends. We can leave here saying with our heads held high, with our hands held high, thy kingdom come. Amen.